going to talk to you about some of the problems that they have faced over the years in relation to the types of hogs that you're producing, some things that they have to have done to make it work uh, more effectively. He'll tell you about their grade and yield program. He's going to tell you how they establish a hog market. And all in all, I want you to think in terms of how this relates to our bottom line, which ultimately is a cost of production. Because in order for us to si survive, we have got to have profit. So on that basis, then, I want you to uh, give your full attention to uh, Frank Linga, who came down from uh, Sioux Falls, uh, Iowa, to be with you today. Frank. Thank you. Uh Alan, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome the opportunity to come down to St. Louis to your convention to visit with you about things in common, I'm sure. It was a couple of months ago that Dale Simonson, our corporate hog buyer, called and asked if I was in position, if my schedule would permit uh, coming down which it was, so I do welcome this opportunity to uh, be here to visit with you. And uh, I was asked to talk in this area of hog production and hog marketing outlook for the uh, coming months, as well as to visit with you a little bit about wholesale cuts, prices, their relationship to weights and grades of hogs, and also to tell you a little bit about a hog buying company's marketing structure and how we go about uh, setting the market each uh, day. As Alan indicated, I am in the livestock extension division of the company, which is basically that of working with livestock producers, uh, taking educational materials uh, to them in numerous uh, different uh, ways. So I am not a hog buyer, but over the past uh, 30 years of being with John Morell and Company, I have had a close association with both the buying department and with the provisions department. Uh, so uh, hopefully that the material that I have uh, to relate to you will be of uh, interest and value as you uh, pursue your efforts in the in the NFO organization. There's one or two of these transparencies that may not come through the best where you are located. The copy will get larger and subsequently a little more easier to digest as I go along here. But I'm going to start out first by visiting with you briefly about hog production as we kind of think it took place during the past uh, six months and looking at certain projections down the road for the next year. I still take a lot of stock uh, personally in the crop and livestock reporting service information and then the compilation of that material that is put together uh, at the USDA office. So what, what we're looking at here is just a bit of a recap from one of those reports that tells us what took place in the 14 principal hog producing states that do produce 85% uh, of the market hogs. This is telling us what probably took place over the past six months, as close as their surveys would indicate. The number of sows of farrowing and uh, the production here is compared to 1977. For the months, for this third quarter of June uh, through August of this particular year that we are in now, they tell us that the number of pigs produced, the number of sows farrowed, was practically identical with that of 1977. 
Now those pigs that were farrowed beginning last June are the pigs that we're catching in our kills presently. As you well know, five and a half to uh, six months a time to get these uh, pigs into market. So during December, January, and February, we are going to be catching these pigs that were farrowed up through the month of August. So compared with a year ago, it appears that uh, marketings will be relatively flat. In fact, there could be a little less marketing during this period of time as it appears that more gilts are being held back and will increase production looking into next year. Well, looking at the fourth quarter of this particular year, and those are months September through November, just this past uh, November past, and we're looking at a crop that will be coming to market then, March, April, and May, basically. And they tell us that there was only 3% increase in the number of sows farrowing. 103% of a year ago. So again, if we are going to be holding back extra gilts out of that pig crop, it does not appear that production is going, there is, it does not appear that marketings are going to be a whole lot uh, greater through the March, April, and May uh, months coming up. But with a corn hog ratio presently that we are looking at of about 100 bushels of corn or 100 pounds of pork being equivalent to 22 to 25 uh, uh, bushels of corn in value, historically we can reflect back and when the corn hog ratio did get up to where 100 pounds of live pork was equal to the value of like 18 bushels or or uh, more of corn, well then we're going to see some, likely see some increase in production coming along. But there are some limiting factors, the disease factors, and some other unknowns uh, in there that I would just generally say that the outlook for marketing and subsequently the outlook for price into 1979 looks very favorable. This morning I mentioned possibly we're going to be looking at around a $45, $100 uh, uh, price come uh, next uh, fall with some increase in production coming along and that report will be out I believe the 22nd of December that will give us a little closer projection as to what possibly happened or will be happening during these uh, winter months. But pork is tied a little bit to beef uh, production and beef marketing. They tell us that we're still on the downslide in the number of beef cattle being produced in the United States. The calf crop during 1979 will be less. There will be less calves produced in 1979 than what there has been in any one of the past three or four years. So we're about to bottom out in cattle production and about to start uphill probably 1980, 81. We will see some uh, slight increase in calf numbers again. <clears throat> Look at the functioning or function of a hog procurement uh, structure. What we need to keep in mind when we're talking about a hog buying operation, what is the objective of that hog buying operation? I'd like for us to concentrate just a moment on that. A corporate hog buyer that's managing several plants and managing the hog procurement for several plants, this is the thing that he's got in mind. He's got to procure a sufficient number of hogs on a daily basis to operate those plants of his at a desired level. Now what is a desired level? We can't say that 36 hours or 40 hours or 50 hours is a desired level. The desired level changes every day and every week based on any cutting margin or value that the packer has represented in those hogs. Maybe the desired level this week is 38 hours. Maybe the desired level next week might be 50 hours if we are in the black, well into the black in the cutout margins. So the desired level varies from one day and certainly from one week uh, to the next. 36 hours is the number of hours that the packing industry guarantees labor. 
we've got to round up 36 hours a week of kill or else we've got to pay labor for working 36 and send them home uh, without having worked two, three, four, five hours. And this does happen and has happened off and on, uh, not only in the hog operation but in uh, beef and lamb operations in our plants uh, during the past year or two. Okay, in order to carry on, get those hogs bought, it takes very careful communications, close communications between the corporate hog buyer and the corporate product manager. These two individuals kind of represent the nerve center of the buying organization. The corporate hog buyer knows the availability of hogs and the trends in marketing. The corporate product manager knows the feel, has the feel of how this product is moving and what kind of dollars he can get out of that product. But they have to communicate very closely then uh, back with the local hog buyer and the local uh, procurement manager at each of these respective plants because those people have the feel at the local level and the salespeople have the feel in the sales territories uh, that they supervise and move product into. After they've determined uh, on a day-to-day -day basis here how many hogs they can use, what the level of hours they, they want to work at, and then they've got to get out and get these hogs bought. We use numerous sources in procuring these hogs. We have six different slaughter plants across the United States. Several of the plants work a little bit differently. The larger plants use practically all of these media in securing their daily hog kill supply. We would categorize under direct purchases such uh, systems as the delivery to the local scale, just unannounced deliveries, roving buyers that bid on the farm, grade and yield hogs that come in where the buyer says, want to sell these hogs to your grade and yield contract delivery. We buy from public, off public markets. We have order buyers, maybe on public markets or maybe order buyers that are uh, covering sales or have their order buying points at different places around. And sales barns, we cover sales barns once in a while. And uh, then I have listed the NFO working arrangement that we uh, have. So those basically are the sources of a hog supply for our plant operations. What or how does a hog buyer, corporate hog buyer and then the local hog buyer go about setting their market? How do they determined today that the hog market was going to be, I don't know what it was, maybe forty-nine and a half dollars I understand it's been breaking. We've had a lot of strength here lately. There's been heavy Christmas demand, particularly for hams. Uh, hams been selling ten dollars a hundred more than what loins are, which is a bit of a seasonal thing. It happens every once in a while at this time of the year. I'd say eleven months out of the year loins are the highest priced cut out of the hog carcass. You get in six weeks before Christmas time, hams. Ham is a Christmas item. Ham is an Easter item and you have some extra strengths uh, developing for hams at that time. A lot of industry buys hams to give to the employees as a little bonus before Christmas so you get some extra strength developing in the hog businesses at, at that time so we're probably coming out from under a little bit of that adjustment uh, right uh, presently. So to set the hog buyer or the hog market for the day, you have to look at what is the availability of hogs. What was the movement through Iowa, through Illinois? What's the movement on the terminal? Uh, how well is, has this product been moving? Has the sales department been able to hold a line on price, on product, or uh, have they had to back off or have they been able to move ahead? What day of the week? We're going to lay into these hogs a little heavier the four part of the week, Monday, Tuesday, because the, uh, the desire of a hog buying organization not to carry 
but a bare minimum of hogs over a weekend, enough to get started up, say, on Monday morning, and then get the hogs bought uh, to tide them through the first few uh, days of the week, slack off towards the end so as not to have a buildup of hogs over the weekend. Holidays approaching. This is, has some bearing on what the hog market is going to be. Weather conditions. Is there a storm brewing? Are we likely to get uh, socked in with a, a 10, 15 inches of snow so no wheels are going to be turning, no hogs coming out of the farm yards? And with a guarantee of 36 hours uh, work a week for these employees, you just can't afford to get caught short without hogs in the plant. That plant's going to crank up even if there's three foot of snow that's fallen overnight. And then it's the employee's obligation to be there uh, to uh, get those hogs worked through the plant. Farming pressures. I mentioned this morning, when corn planting time comes along, we forget about marketing hogs and get the corn in the ground. Then we'll load up a load or two of hogs and get them out. So those are a number of factors that have some bearing on establishing the market. Looking at the long range uh, uh, prospects, whether markets are going to be high or going to be lower, these are items certainly that would have some bearing. What is the long range outlook? Hog numbers going up or going down? Uh, what's the employment level going to be? Is it going to be at 6% or 10% unemployed? What's the uh, labor outlook? Are we going to be experiencing a lot of strikes uh, around the country? This will have some bearing on purchasing power. What's the outlook for exporting considerable amount of pork? That will have a bearing on long-range price. Your legislative actions through here will have some bearings as to what the price is going to be next year and the year after in the hog business. Disease outbreaks. Seemed like the last few years disease has had quite a bearing on hog prices within a year's time. We've had quite a lot of pseudorabies breaking out up in northwest Iowa, in the South Dakota presently. If you just knock this percentage uh, or the number of pigs born per sow down by half a pig per sow, that represents quite a volume of pigs over the course of a year's time. <clears throat> Get in here to some of these factors that actually affect the value of hogs. <clears throat> in our morale operation, these are the grades of pigs that we list on buy sheets lot analysis sheets. They compare fairly closely with the USDA grades, except we have three added grades in here. We have a number seven, which is kind of a poor cutting number one type of a hog that will be all right for amount of back fat and length and falls a little short of loin eye and quite short of desirable meatiness, particularly through the ham region. We have a five, which is an excessively overfinished type of a pig. We have an eight, which is kind of an in-plant grade for mutilated hogs. If we have to knock a loin or a ham out of a hog due to abscess condition inside, maybe a polyarthritis or arthritis in a hog where you've got to drop some product and it does interfere with the total value of that hog carcass, then we would call it a grade, a grade eight. Weight has a bearing on your purchase value because we do purchase by weight breaks. Heavy and lightweight hogs are discounted. We'll see that just a little bit later on another transparency. Yield has a bearing on the price and value of this hog. What's the fill condition on the hog? What's the breeding background? Was the pig uh, uh, bread is a meat type pig. What was the stress condition possibly due to hot weather, cold weather, or the trucking conditions getting that pig in, in the market? Bruises will certainly uh, knock down on the percent of yield on a load of hogs. Mud, lots of rain, the mud holes around the farmyard are filled with mud. It's hot, the pigs are wallowing in there. A pig can come to town with a couple of pounds of mud on that pig and that will affect it by a percent. The weight of the hog certainly has a bearing on the value of the pig because heavy weights, uh, heavy hogs, we are looking for 
a higher yield standards on those type pigs. We'll talk a little bit about add-on values by grades. These again are the grades one through eights. If you're marketing pigs that weigh 200 pounds and down, there is no premium paid. And this tells you that I think packers in general are not interested in buying pigs weighing below 200 pounds. If you market 200 and down pigs that are fat, then the discounts are in effect the same as they are on heavy hogs. We are desiring to have pigs that weigh above 200 pounds and usually above 210 uh, pounds. And when they come in weighing above 200 pounds, then premiums of $2 on number ones and $1 on number twos are paid. This is on a carcass basis. That reduces back somewhat on a live weight basis. No premium on these number sevens that have relatively poor cutout values as compared to number ones and twos and no premiums on the base but the discounts on these fat hogs becomes very strong so that tells us let's breed let's market for number ones and twos and let's eliminate these fat hogs lard today is worth about 20 cents a pound lean meat is worth like i said on hams upwards of 90 cents to a dollar a pound on lean meat so we want a high percent of that hog carcass to be represented in the high priced lean cuts now let's take a look at what actually occurs here in pricing out two pigs a number one and a number four grade hog Number one is that meat type pig, and number four is a fat type pig. Understand that both of them are weighing 235 pounds. Why is that number one pig worth more dollars per hundred weight than the number four or the overfat pig? Almost the entire, now let me back up just a little bit and tell you what I've done here. This illustration, shows us what happens if you just take one half the carcass from the number one and one half the carcass from this number four pig and cut it up. You will come out with approximately 20.8 pounds of ham on the number one, come up with 18.22 pounds of ham on the number four. On the, let's go down here, regular loins, we come up with a 17.8 pounds of loin. This is just a loin off one side of the carcass now understand on the meat type pig you come up with 15.30 pound loin on the number four pig. The big reason for a price differential when you're looking at ones against fours or twos against fours or whatever it might be is in the percent of the weight that is represented in these four high price cuts. And if you look at this figure here, in the number one pig, 64.17% of the carcass weight is represented in high priced lean cuts. As versus a lardy pig over here, you come up with only 55.57% of the carcass weight represented in these higher priced lean cuts. Well now there's got to be a hundred percent all told here when you cut up a half a carcass or a whole carcass so where's the other percentage represented? It's basically represented down here in the large cuts that come off this hog carcass. The fat backs and the cutting fats and the total your total lard fats on a meat type pig is only 4.23% as versus 11.32% fats in this number four lardy pig. Otherwise, most of your other items stay pretty much constant. Neck, bones, jaws, tails, your percentages and your dollar values across stay pretty much the same. But when you're comparing a meaty hog with a lardy hog, your difference comes in the percentage factors of lean meat to carcass, much higher in a lean hog than in a fat hog. 
bellies is another item that I could just uh, relate to here a little bit. On a lean hog, you have 17.10% of the carcass represented in bellies. Over here on the lardy pig, you have 18.33. You have more belly, you have a higher percentage of belly in a number four pig. However, bellies are not nearly as high price per pound here as are the prices on these lean cuts. So just keep in mind that when you're talking about better quality meatier hogs against the lardier hogs, it's actually the percent of cuts that you're looking at much better in the lean hog as versus the lardy pig. <clears throat> now we've looked at one ones and fours uh, weighed against the cutout uh, values. Let's look at what happens if you have two number two pigs but one of them weighs 225, this is a lightweight pig, and the other weighs 255. Why do we have weight breaks when you get beyond 230 pounds? In the industry today, we have been breaking at 230 pounds. It has hogs become heavier, 230 to 240. I believe it's a quarter uh, break, 240 to 250, either a quarter or a half a dollar, 250 to 260, your price breaks uh, by 10 pound weight increments. Normally that starts at 240, but over the past month or two, we've been getting a run of rather constant heavy hogs. The hogs have been averaging at 239 to 240 pounds average weight at the Sioux Falls plant. So we get more of that heavy product than what uh, the trade will take at a price. So the price is discounted to some extent on those heavy hogs. And that's what this overlay transparency will point out to you that when you're comparing number two hogs of different weights, it's the pounds that are represented in the cuts. The skinned ham here out of a 225 pound pig weighed slightly over 19 pounds. The ham out of this 255 pound pig weighed clear up there to 21 and a half pounds. And heavy hams are priced, have been priced, and usually are priced less than the value of hams from these lighter weight pigs or lighter weight hams. Likewise, loins, a 16-pound loin worth 91.75, a heavier loin at 18 pounds, 90 and a half dollars per hundred weight. So when you're looking at hogs of the same grade but difference in live weight, those heavier hogs are discounted because the cuts that come out of heavier hogs are heavier and subsequently are going to be selling at a lesser price. I think that's true here with bellies again. I can't quite see due to the reflection here on the screen, but uh, here the belly out of this lightweight pig weighed 14.3 pounds, the belly over here 18.8 .8 pounds. The bellies out of a heavy hog naturally are going to be heavy. And the price was 57 and a quarter as vi versus $59 per hundred weight on these lighter weight bellies. All the other factors, cuts are fairly constant. So your difference in values in the same grade hogs, but of different weights, is due to the heavier cuts and subsequently a less price on the heavier cuts. I know part of your program is directed toward grade and yield marketing of hogs. We have purchased upwards of 35% of our hog kill at the Sioux Falls, South Dakota plant on grade and yield. It will vary from 10% up to 35%. I would not tell you that grade and yield selling is or buying as far as a packer is concerned is any better system of buying than buying hogs outright because in the end run if you're out standing on a man's place bidding on hog you're supposed to be taking into account the same considerations what are those hogs going to yield what are they going to grade as what the grading sheet will actually show once the hogs are slaughtered 
But there are some points here that I think can be made with you when you are selling grade and yield. This is what we call a hog lot analysis sheet. It's the kind of a report that the producer gets back once he's sold a load of hogs to us on a grade and yield marketing basis. It shows a lot of detail, shows the breakdown of the different weight brackets here. There's been some additional scribbling put on this lot analysis. Those lines don't show up on your regular lot analysis report. These penciled in figures don't uh, show up. Those were put on merely to facilitate making an explanation here. But when you sell hog grade and yield, you should make a strong effort to keep those pigs in like a 210 to 240 weight bracket because the packer has base prices depending upon the weight increment that these live hogs will fall into. Like back August, back in August, 210s to 240s were priced at $47. Uh, 200s to 210s were priced at $46, $46.50, and $46 on the next uh, lighter weight group. This man had hogs pretty well spread from the 190 weight bracket up through 270. So subsequently, his ultimate selling price may not have looked as good to him as he thought it was going to be, because he might have called the hog buyer in the morning and said, uh, uh, Joe, what do you, what's your price on hogs today? And our head hog buyer might have told him, well, our base price is 47. He thinks, well, that's great. Uh, take those hogs in and get 47. But when he brings them in, spread all over the sheet here for a weight, there's discounts on both ends, on the lighter end, and discounts up here on the heavier ends for those reasons that I explained to you a bit ago. Uh, question come up here is, well, what do we do? Weigh each of these pigs in order to get them into their respective weight bracket? That isn't the way it works. You mark it in this case, and to find the figure how many hogs are represented here, 40 hogs. Brought in 40 hogs. One scale ticket was punched on those 40 hogs. But when they go to kill and go into the cooler, they are graded just prior to going into the cooler, and they are weighed just prior to going into the cooler. And that weight of the carcass classifies that carcass back into the live hog weight category. In other words, if the scale says 168 and a half pounds, uh, that hog will go into uh, one of these weight categories uh, here. Uh, 210 to 240 pounds. So it's the ultimate scale, the weight of the carcass, that actually classifies these hogs back into their respective live weight divisions and subsequently the price that has been established originally. But not only does it classify the hog into its weight division, but a grader, Experienced graders will visually put a grade code on these hogs. What was the grade? Was it a one? Was it a two? Was it a seven? There was one eight in here, which actually uh, was a discount hog. I think everything else on here uh, plus an additional premium, or at least was at the base. These number three hogs just commanded the base uh, price. <clears throat> but the lot analysis sheet also tells what the standard yield was, and this is not showing here, and I had our print shop where these transparencies are made up uh, draw out just the section that I wanted to speak about in order to get some enlargement of the figures here, otherwise you try to uh, make a transparency with a complete packet of figures that show on a lot analysis sheet, it gets too small for uh, you to uh, see. It does tell us down here how many pigs were superior meat type, how many were desirable meat type. 35% were meat type, 50% were still desirable meat type, but not the superior kind. So when you get 85% of your pigs uh, getting into number ones or twos, that's a very good load of hogs. <coughs> I mentioned lightweight pigs and the fact that we're not very strong buyers of lightweight uh, pigs, this illustration might be of interest to you. It costs just so much to kill each hog, $12 per head. 
labor costs, overhead costs. You've got 150, 200 men on this killing gang, dressing gang, dressing these hogs. So whether you've got a 205 pound hog or whether there's a 295 pound pig going down the rail, it takes the same amount of labor, same amount of time. The chain speed goes at whatever the plant's running at, 500. We're running 740 hogs an hour at our plant at Sioux Falls. When you convert that over to how much does it cost per 100 weight live, that just dividing 205 pounds into 12, it costs 585 per 100 weight to dress this hog. Down here it costs $4.07 per 100 weight live to dress that pig. When you get over on the carcass basis, it costs $8.00 per hundred on a carcass base to kill this pig, it costs 550 on a carcass base to kill that pig. So this is a factor that your plant management has to be looking at too as to how strong a buyer is or what the discount has to be on lightweight pigs as versus the heavier weight pigs. We all know that in the best interest of the total industry to keep people consuming pork, which they are doing a good job of it, however, we've got a ways to go yet. Our per capita con pork consumption is about 58 pounds per person. It's been up as high as 70 in years gone by. But people do like pork. The pork producers have done an excellent job of promoting pork. But we do need to pay, continue to pay attention to the breeds of swine that are getting the job done. And I have categorized different breeds of hogs for different strong features, for growth rate and feed efficiency. Watching the test station results, we know that spots are a fast doing hog. Durox come in well, Yorkshire's stand in good, followed by Burks, Hamps, and Landrace. This is the way I would categorize them by watching test station results. Other production results that I have seen would tell us that the Landrace, or the Yorkshire, the Landrace, and Chester White are breeds that are particularly strong for maternal characteristics, for larger litters, and for femininity, mothering ability, temperament. Other studies show us that for the meat qualities, which breeds of hogs are strongest for meat features? The Hamps, the Durox, and the Poland stand high. The Spots, Chesters, and Yorks come in there. I think this is good that each breed of hogs has some particularly strong feature about it because then we can use them in a cross-bred combination and bring these three features together in a real strong uh, crossing program. <clears throat> when I'm out talking to producers about hog production, I'll frequently throw on a transparency like this to give some ideas in our judgment as we watch hogs go through the packing house, watch these lot analysis reports. We know that you need these mother breeds in here we need to keep production up because if you didn't keep production up, we wouldn't be able to run a packing house either. So even though the meat qualities aren't the strongest on some of these breeds, you need them as a foundation breed for mothering ability. Cross with some of these meatier breeds of hogs. Get into a three-way cross then. York, Hamp, and Duroc has been a particularly good cross up in our territory. York. Spot and the Durox a good cross and so on down. All those are, are good crosses, but the idea is to combine the strengths of the several breeds and come up with a higher percentage of these ones and twos. Presently we're running between 65 and 70 percent of our hog kill will grade number ones and twos. I think we're probably average, maybe a little bit stronger than average in the industry for the percentage of hogs that are making ones and two. So we've got quite a long ways to go, 30 percent, uh, at least 30, 35 percent area here to continue to improve meat qualities to get up to this 100 percent figure. <clears throat> we've talked about pricing these hogs, how grade and how weight has a bearing on it. Talked about breeds of hogs that are getting the job done. One thing that we, one last thing that we need to 
pay a lot of attention to, and that's getting these hogs assembled and getting them to market in A1 uh, shape. We have run a livestock conservation program at some of our plants. We've been going about 25 years at the Sioux Falls plant where we keep a record of the deads and the crippled hogs from every source of supply, even if it's from a group of uh, your NFO stations up in our territory, we report back to them how many deads and how many cripples we experience from their uh, buying points on a six month basis as well as on the year ending basis. We've got a pretty good fix, I feel, as to what a trucker ought to be able to do in delivering hogs and holding down the dead and cripple loss. We make our interpretation on the basis of how many hogs can this trucker or this group of truckers serving a given assembly point deliver for a frequency of one dead. Can he deliver a thousand head? Can he deliver six thousand head and not have over one dead hog? We do call four cripples the equivalent of one dead in our program. In other words, you take the uh, value, you get four crippled hogs, and you've got to trim out hams, possibly loins and shoulders. You end up with about the value in four hogs that you'd have in one good hog. That's why we call four cripples equivalent to one dead. And I thought it would be of interest to kind of flash on here the way these reports come out. Uh, <coughs> we number all of our buying stations. And when we report to a buying station, we will write that buying station in and put in the volume of hogs that, that was delivered from that point. Now here again, this transparency, there was a column uh, showing the cripple equivalent deads uh, left out in order to consolidate the figures down so as to have a larger blow up here on the screen for you to look at. But we categorize the job that an individual is doing if he's uh, hauling, say, like... Uh, 6,000 or more hogs to market for a frequency of one dead, and that's what these people did. There was one dead for 11,370 delivered. There was one dead for 900 or 9,964. Those we would call excellent, doing an excellent job. We've got good category that runs from one dead for each 3,000 or more hogs delivered up to the 6,000 point. And then we have a fair category and then we have a unsatisfactory category down here. And I don't mean to be poking uh, uh, holes at the NFO here on this particular report because uh, we have stations that were worse than the few NFO stations that were delivering to us up in the Sioux Falls uh, uh, territory. We had one trucker down here that his record was delivering one hog or having delivering only 89 hogs for a frequency of one dead. Uh, that was a fellow that got caught up in a snowstorm, I believe it was last winter, and he didn't have too big a volume, but that's the way his record turned out. He hauled in 89, had 61 deads uh, here. And this is something you really need to watch, is the weather conditions on trucking hogs, hot, humid days, or uh, storm conditions that are uh, developing, because it is a costly thing. Now, the deads, the value of these deads and the deads and the cripples themselves is costly, but I truly believe that there is as much loss represented in these pigs in the way of tissue shrink and bruise condition that's going to come off these hogs as there is in the actual deads or cripples uh, themselves. In other words, if you have a dead or two on a hog, it's kind of hard to kill if you go out there with a club and try to kill a hog, you know. Uh, so you've got to really abuse a hog in a truck, uh, keep him confined in there in a hot, humid day while you stop and have lunch or something on the way uh, to market, or overcrowding. Overcrowding is one of the serious, most serious of conditions in uh, causing dead loss. But when you're having deads, you're having excess tissue uh, shrink as a rule and very possibly more bruising resulting on those hogs. The average trucking job was which was very poor. I'm not very proud of our first six months, but we had these winter loss conditions with some storms. We had three bad losses last winter uh, in storm-related uh, conditions. So our 
record showed only 1,337 hogs delivered for a frequency of one dead for the first six months of this year, which is very poor because industry-wide, truckers are delivering approximately 2,800 head of hogs for a frequency of one dead. And that's the kind of a record that we ought to be shooting for. So you folks that are supervising assembly uh, points, collection points, uh, it's well to set. Please turn the tape over to side number two.